So I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. So I'm, we're going to get started. And then if, if people are on academic time, they're on academic time. <laughs> um, OK, so back in uh, 2012, uh, I was one of the general co-chairs of the Human Robot Interaction Conference. It was a traumatic experience. Um, it was a lot of work. And, and then uh, this past year, Gerhardt uh, 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 did this for the HRI 2014 that was hosted at his university in Bielefeld, and it was stunningly smooth, and I was very impressed. <laughs> um, during, the, during that conference also, though, there was an opportunity to tour the facilities and see that all the different robotics projects that are going on at Bielefeld, and that was even more impressive. Um, and so there was an opportunity to, to have uh, Gerhard come here and give a talk. He does work in HRI, and so, it was an op and so I was very excited about that as well. Um, so this is kind of a great opportunity for us to all learn about each other uh, and, and get a greater understanding of what's going on, especially in Europe on the HRI front. Um, Gerhard is extremely uh, low-key, so um, you may have noticed on his bio that he is the rector of his university. That's actually a really big deal. Um, <laughs> Um, but he's completely approachable. Feel free to, to come and talk to him after the, after the session, and he will be at the PSR next door for those of you in the PSR thing. Um, so with that, I'll let you go right into it so we have time for questions. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I have seen a lot of things today, very interesting things, and first of all, my compliment on what you're doing here. So it makes the job even tougher to talk to you today, and I was thinking about what ca what can I explain? I know the size and the renome of uh, Carnegie Mellon and uh, since I have been a student in the 70s, so um, uh, I'm already time in computer science since 75, so you can imagine. And uh, so I put a kind of things together, I tried per uh, which might be perhaps of interest for you. First of all, I will start with one example, one experiment, our most real world experiment we ever had. And then I'll f I will explain a special structure. Aaron was talking about the building we have had the conference, you see, you have seen the labs, and this is strongly connected to a center of excellence. And I will try to describe you this kind of organization, this kind of funding scheme and this kind of cooperation which evolved over a decade or more than a decade between a number of colleagues and focusing on a certain topic and really cooperation between nowadays it's about 32 to 35 groups and you will see more than 200 people are working together at that point. I will then report on a, on a very influential for us, very influential experiment from 2007. So it was the beginning of 2007, our home tour experiment. And then I show you just short classical pattern recognition AI stuff on space, dialogue, actions, and learning. In the content, there's something special which we call social, especially in the learning context. And then new experiments and systems, and I try to give a conclusion at the end. So our project or our experiment Soch Europe. It was a cooperation with a German space agency and uh, they asked us, okay, so long-term space flights make high demands on physical condition of astronauts. That's the truth. So, but how to motivate astronauts to do it better, to do it more than they do it normally? And you see here, sporting activity must be done. And the question was, can a social robot, and you see here the now, influence the behavior of the astronauts in space? So the astronaut here is spinning. It's on Earth. I show you the surrounding of the experiment. And the now is motivating. And you see here a little bit, so less tempo, less uh, turns around, and so on. So the uh, the robot is a motivator. And another problem in space is the mental consti uh, constitution of the astronauts. Will human accept robots because they are less weight? They are, do not have to work otherwise in, the, uh, in space, accept social robot as an interaction partner. And can we improve 
the atmosphere in the group. And this has been the second. So this astronaut is playing with Floby. I will talk a more about Floby later on, memory. And this has been the exper so just an example how it looks like. So it's a communication and robot follows. I have been in the Disney lab today, so the old Disney ideas of cartoon-like emotional displays. Let's talk in, in this way. So it's, it's really an interaction, and Floby is reacting, expresses emotions, and you will see uh, later on how it looks like. Here you see one example. Floby can change gender and so on, but, but that's not the question at that time. So. It has been a long-term isolation study, and perhaps you can imagine you do not have often the opportunity to do such an experiment when you do human-robot interaction. We have two times eight probands for 18 days in closed area. And 18 days means we had no chance to repair, to restart, to change software, and so on. So the robots were, have been 18 days in this closed area. All the Pseudo robot uh, astronauts, it has been in Cologne at the uh, uh, area there, has a demanding daily schedule, like it is at a real space station. And every proband had to cycle at least one hour per day, and every proband had to play at least two turns of the game pairs each day. And they have one, the two groups, and uh, so we have a lot of data. And surprisingly, th that has been my great fear, that the robot would not survive 18 days, or at least one of the two robots, but they survived twice. The, uh, they survived both. The only problem had been, uh, it was day four or five, I do, I'm not sure where they had water problems. But the robot works. So the results, at a short glance, both robotic platforms with two the permanent load, we have had no hardware error. There was one power failure for the whole environment, but uh, the robot was not responsible for. We have rare soft crashes, so we had the chance, uh, the robots, uh, the astronauts were teach how to restart. That has been the only one button. Uh, and the problems played more of the game pair than required, so they had some fun. So in this lot of data are now examined by the German uh, aerospace agency, and uh, this is just a shortcut on what the results are. And this interaction, this social interaction, is one of the goals we are following since more than a decade. And this was one of the tests which were essential for us, that the persons, these eight persons really keep active over 18 days with the, uh, with the robots and were not scared, afraid, bored, or something like that by the robots. And this is done, all these was one of the results of the SciTech, the Cognitive Interaction Technology. The term cluster of excellence is not chosen by us, it's a term used by the German government for this kind of funding. We have at the SciTech defined a threefold mission on a technology side, on a scientific side, and on the side to bridge cultures. Technology to elevate interaction with technical systems into ease and natural of human communication. Or as a sketch, we are trained to, to buy a technical system and we get a handbook how to use it. And our long-term goal is that in the technical system, a handbook how to use humans is implemented. So just to skip it around. Scientific, of course, that's a task at, our, at a university. And we had a chance at Bielefeld University that we have an um, uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary history. So we have been successful in really getting involved people from life sciences to technology, engineering, and also social sciences into this project. And you will see some of the results which and computer scientists or robotic people perhaps would not think about if you have not psychologists or uh, people from the uh, social sciences around you. So 
here I do not have to tell you what uh, cognitive interaction technology is useful for every life uh, situation and some of the keys of the key fun of the facts about SciTech. It was funded within the so-called German Excellence Initiative in 2007. We have successfully renewed in 2017. There are 43 clusters of excellence and there's only one in robotics. That's at Bielefeld. So you could apply for, independent of what you're doing, the idea was research excellence. In Bielefeld, about 250 researchers are involved and we have an integrated graduate school with about 80 PhD students. And this cluster funding is very nice. So you had to write a proposal. And if you are successful, it's really pain to write a proposal integrating 32 uh, groups, restricted on 75 pages, exactly, not more, in a two-stage, at the first stage, 20 pages, second, 75. But if you are successful, you get 7 million a year without a project definition. You had to design it on your own, you had to organize it on your own. So in common, we have uh, 18 million funding, the cluster plus a university plus external projects. And the, the paradigm is for the new period that cognitive interaction systems require some kind of dynamic growth instead of a steady construction fix from a blueprint. So this has been the basic idea following for the second and this is a specification for the project, what you see now. That's all we had proposed. So we assume that a deep understanding is necessary and scaffolding mechanism to guide and focus the growth, adaptivity to keep the system responsive to change, and resource sensitivity, a limitation of resources that leads to a better solution or perhaps an optimal solution. Optimal is every, it's each time a very difficult word. So, and we have partners. That was also required that we have non-university partners that support the idea. And we have corporations with, a, and they supported us very strongly, Honda Research Europe with a robot that understand. Beetle, that's a scare hold, uh, uh, company looking for uh, people with special needs, elderly people, and so on, and they are our real world. Battlesman, interactive agents and cognitive media, perhaps you know, do not know the name Battlesman, but you know the name Random House and Penguin. They are owned by Battlesman. So it's a family owned company near, near Bielefeld. And Miele, as far as I know, is n known in Northern America, the uh, house. house. And we have a second line. This is more on this in-home, but we also have a, uh, a project line funded uh, for us, which is so-called high German High Tech Initiative. The idea is to couple university and companies. And the goal here was for the region to go from mechatronics to intelligent systems. And Bielefeld is one of the two university partners and we have strong synergies. And this kind of project is funded by the German Federal Ministry by 40 million for, four, for five years. But the companies had to add another 40. So we have a budget for these five years for uh, over 100 million euros and 120 local companies are involved. So on this topic of intelligent systems. Aaron Mandit mentioned the new building. I would never show a building in a scientific talk, but this is special because it translates our pro project ideas or organizational ideas of the excellence cluster into concrete. So we have a central lab where all the results are flowing together on special system designed to cover as most as possible from the various activities in the cluster and the other labs are surrounded. And what's important, we have here central yeah, uh, lecture hall and a communication area. And 
The communication follows also not only on one floor, but you have the direct connections through the other floors. And we were with about 300 people in the building and there was a permanent communication. So, of course, we have different kinds of robots involved and uh, here is just, we have the Megabot, Byron is a uh, kind of adaptive media development. We have uh, the Hector, that is this one here, uh, designed in biology. And we have the Floby, we have a cooperation with IIT, the ICAP, and uh, the NOW, and uh, the Shadow Hands, uh, where we are interested in uh, really human-like grasping, showing, and so on. So we started with this type of social robotics. I already mentioned seven years ago. And we started with a home tour scenario. So we were asking how to interact, how can we get an idea what is necessary in an interaction where human does not know a lot about, or almost nothing about the robot he's interacting with, but the robot should have an idea what the human is behaving. So we started with a study of 24 participants without prior knowledge. So no students, we asked at the street. And the robot, they have to fulfill a task with the robot. They had to show the robot an apartment. So not the robot, the human. The human had to show the robot an apartment. And the robot has to learn about rooms and objects. And the only knowledge of the robot has been about interaction patterns. Not about the rooms, not about the objects, but how to interact with humans. And the participate with no experience uh, no experienced people really showed some unexpected behaviors. I show you one. So here you see the person we needed microphones at that time and uh, headset. This is the apartment. It was one apartment outside, so we had, for example, problems with the floor. But, oh, sorry. Mah. So that's a short interaction, and you see the person is talking to the robot, and the robot tries to get an impression of the room and turns around. So, and now you see the, the person does not know what, how to deal with. Yeah, the robot is not, no longer looking at him, it's just turning around. So this was one of the lessons we learned, we have to look, we have to have a close look on interaction patterns. And what are the, what is necessary that the robot is doing to keep the human in contact to the robot. And we see that perhaps we can use a lot if we are able to detect emotions. These are really emotional yeah, reactions of persons to the robot during this experiment. So from this idea, we were looking at, based on this experiment, what is as feedback. We have to look at feedback. Feedback is very important. You cannot keep a, a human into a situation with the robot if the robot is not going, uh, giving feedback. And here, this is a mimicry experiment. So. <laughs> You see the cat, it's uh, de uh, developed by Philips here at the above. And uh, we have here just reading a, a, a story. And uh, the robot is mimicking the face of the, of the human. And you see it's very strange for humans. But the, uh, it turned the reaction of the robot really changed the behavior of the human. Let it run a little bit. So, the basic idea has been, okay, we have to look at these data. We have to look at interaction patterns. We have to have a look at what is necessary. And we need the psychologists, we need people from social 
in, uh, who can look at social interaction, who can analyze studies and give us hints how this interaction could work and what is necessary for the robots. So the, it has been quite simple what requirements we have to fulfill. We have to recognize rooms. There is a need for object detection, of course, recognize, uh, recognizing faces, recognizing actions, and of course you need some memory. And what's important at the same time, beside these analysis, pattern recognition and so on, is that there is a need to communicate internal states. And this can of the robot. The participation in a dialogue and the emotional reaction of, in their, uh, to in their, uh, of the interaction partners are very uh, important and to use facial expressions and to analyze facial expressions. So I will go step by step a little bit about space, for example. Uh, we are mapping a line scene model so that we have a hierarchy of these objects around those, this just on, on uh, uh, lasers, laser images we classify. So we have a linkage between abstract model, oh sorry, oh. with the perception of a complex scenario and the model is aligned uh, to uh, the describer's representation. So this is the rough space the robot has to move in. So the certain objects are now needed for classification. If you have an example like the uh, home tour uh, in, uh, uh, if you remember this, there is, the objects are only of interest if they have some communicative ne necessity. So the rest is just avoidance and uh, marks for, uh, for movements. The dialogue model, it's not a special one. It's a, it's a task state protocol with some interaction patterns. But I used this slide to show you that we use the same dialogue module and the same, we do it also with uh, the vision systems for the different robots. So this has been a real tough task that you have to work together in 32 groups and you accept that you have one dialogue model for each of the robots homed at the various groups. But now it pays back. It, it took a time, but it pays back. One dialogue example in a learning situation with a two hand that's done by Helge Ritter. So here the task is to show and to denote and to, uh, to tell the robots what are the objects and what is the name of the object. So we have pointing gestures, but you have also grasping in this task. This is the shadow hand, the old one, where uh, it's a very complex control need because it's air here. And the communication partner is one of our old stuff, an experiment of, the, uh, of uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, but we will, we change this to, to Floby uh, in the meanwhile. And you see that the grasping works here quite well and it should be put into the bowl. More or less it works stable. And the new shadow hand is a little bit lighter and is again uh, electrical and not, uh, and not air controlled. So I started with the, that I will also talk about social aspects of learning. So we have in computer science or in uh, machine learning, there is the basic approach is on data. More data and more data and more data. But learning could also be supported by social interactions. And we have learned that, for example, if we look at the interaction between parents and their kids, there are special social signals where you have to take care, where you have to take care, which you show you clearly that's important. Because children had the need to learn action segmentation, object recognition, and speech understanding at the same time. And they do not know one or the other before. And based on this, in psychology there has been an idea developed called acoustic packaging. And that's a kind of uh, 
first of all, of action segmentation. So the hypothesis is children are able to discover meaningful uh, units in action. Language helps to segment the sequence. And the prerequisite, the idea behind is that you have a synchronicity of language and action. And this is called acoustic packaging. And this acoustic packaging is, if you can translate it into algorithms, it can provide you a pure bottom-up segmentation. So give me two minutes to explain how it works. So first of all, it's a fusion of cues, a temporal association of a multimodal input stream. So, but it's not exact at the same time, it's just ranging. So you have at the top, uh, a measurement of changes, then you have a measurement on, on speech, and so on. So here, this is speech signal, and you see here, uh, it's just when you measure the energy, that's okay. And if you have a model on uh, some uh, language pieces, you can learn the word which is spoken in a certain segment. This is a simple approach to movements, just measuring the uh, difference between images. And here you see the amount of motion. And then you put these together and you get a kind of parallel parallelity between these. And this is developing. And this, you see also the experiment. So this woman is showing her son how to deal with these boxes. And if you look here, the, this point is, look here. That's, you should attract the communication partner and therefore the complex sec uh, sequence. Uh, we did the same experiment, the woman explaining the same to her husband and you see nothing. Yeah, because look here, bop, 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 finished. But with a, ki with a kit, you really can see the different steps in action and here you see the motion and uh, the speech, and from that on you can arrange and you can learn in parallel action segmentation and language. It's not perfect that you get the language, the real words and so uh, real word, words and so on, but it's similar to the way uh, kids learn. So the idea of acoustic packaging and the way we implemented it, we get cues for temporal segmentation of action by speech activity and motion segmentation and cues focused on details of the uh, interaction by finding emphasized syllables and by recogn uh, recognizing the trajectory of movements. This is the idea and by this we implemented a kind of learning in a social context. So as you see an action, the robot has to perceive it, the action is segmented, we are learning the model, the model is evaluated, we generate a feedback on the robot side, and then the next action takes place. So this is implemented, and as long as a robot can attract like a child, you get similar reactions. And this you can use for a social context of learning. And to look like a child, we developed, that's the own robot I developed on my own in my life. So because I had not the appropriate display and I hired a industrial designer and he called the old ideas of Walt Disney, like sketches. And so you see the classical a schematic drawing of a child, the schematic drawing of the robot. The curved forehead, the big round eyes, the small short nose, the small chin, so the facial elements are located relatively low. And this is a, a child impression. And people love the robot. And here, and we wanted to make experiments with the robot. And they are bad ones. So you can change the gender within two minutes. The hair, that's the difference in hair, sufficient. We measured in functional MRI that it is sufficient to change hair. It's supported by more thin or more thick eyebrows, by more thick or thin lips, uh, dark red lips or lighter red lips. So that's just to support, but it works only with the hair. 
So you can do interesting experiments which are very interesting also for, from the other side for psychologists and for social sciences by changing. So it, identical software, you cannot produce it in humans, identical software, different look like, male, female. And we ask people to interact with Floby, to talk to Floby and ask afterward, what would you use Floby for? If Floby looks man-like, car. If it looks woman-like, care, caregiving for kids and elderly people. We ask for competences if Floby is white or if Floby is dark. Same software. Floby white, high competences. Floby Mediterranean style, lower competences in Germany. Of course, that would never happen in any other country. <laughs> but it was really the experiments. I, I had seen the results. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So I let you now alone with about a five minute video, just commenting a little bit. So the idea that's Floby, the design, so but all is in the head. So we want, we will use robot uh, Floby on various bodies of robots. So the task from the very beginning for the designer has been in one, the motors must be in the head. This is a mod, so these are the lips we have at the moment, the hairs and so on, so colored, not colored, thick, thin and so on. And this is a way you can change it in 2 minutes 20. Sorry, I told you in 2 minutes. Uh, that's a little bit faster. That's an older video. You see how you change it. It's really easy. And after 2 minutes, it's gone. And this was done in cooperation with companies outside. So they were really happy about it. It was for them uh, a new kind of project. And we have the cameras in the eyes and uh, we have uh, ears and of course speaking is not not the problem so after two minutes and 20 it's gone so object tracking spot so we have you see here what Floby is seeing that is the reaction of Floby here with blue hairs so that the eyes can really follow and this has been part of the story of cooperation. Each person in Bielefeld doing vision research wants, each student want to have the algorithm on Floby. So this kind of integration really helps in motivating people to work in larger groups. And it's also kind of, of real because you're really interacting. It's not, it's not only software. This is for fixed tracking now. <coughs> so to keep the person is moving and robot has to, uh, the robot has to keep it stable. And you can use it for mimicry. So these are two of the persons. That, that's our central lab. That's a lab for the SciTech, where the integrated projects are put together. They are providing the uh, middleware software and so on. So this is the virtual Floby. Just it's easier, even it's not so expensive. You can produce it nowadays for 20,000 uh, euros, but uh, that's really mimicry. So facial expressions that follows what's known in psychology. And we, were, we have been surprised the way it's accepted and it's, it's really accepted as a communication partner. So this is the rating of expertise. Do you see just the pairs of, for the study
And if you look in yourself, you really will describe it. But, but it's, the results are after communication, not only by, by the design, but after communication with the same software. And this was, male, female was real done with uh, functional MRI so that it's, uh, and you see here, we are going really, we try to have a lot of experiments, a lot of people, and therefore we need non-computer scientists, non-robotics people, because it's, for us, it's pain, believe me. This is one of the studies with elder people how do they react on, uh, on robots and how do they like to interact uh, with the robot and uh, keep they uh, in contact also after a while just uh, explaining stupid things like where is an apple, where is a banana and so on and they keep just by this feedback giving. And here we have had really 128 persons. Floby can learn object so this is another communication so these are examples so I go further on to show you also some other so we are also with the student group going to the RoboCup at home tournament I show an experiment on art guide on social robot human interaction in groups I have already mentioned the simulation of long-term spice flight, virtual assistant, and teeth brushing assistant. This is a RoboCup cup tournament in Singapore. Uh, this is the robot I have shown you at the beginning, just a new version. And uh, the idea here is also to use software we already have, and it's a pure student group, only one postdoc and one PhD is involved, and uh, they like to travel around. The art guide robot, This has really been done in our art hall. And you see here with the infrared that uh, uh, we are looking from, uh, not from the now, but uh, from outside. But the now is explaining the display arts. And it's in the Bielefeld Gallery. So it's not somewhere, and the people, it was a normal Sunday where the people were coming in. That's uh, the interaction we have learned before or looked at before by our, uh, by our uh, partners from uh, uh, sociology and from linguistics. So we have this positioning and spatial arrangement and this is implemented and there we learned this stuff. Here you see a group interaction this has been a European project in the seventh framework uh, together with uh, various colleagues from all over Europe. We have here a Vernissage scenario, uh, a multimodal perception with interaction with now, and here you see how it's calculated. So you're looking at faces, you, tr you uh, try to stabilize it, you, you can see which is the uh, the picture of interest at the moment and you measure various and the group size and so you get into communication with a number of people. And now we'll go to assistant technology. I mentioned that we have one of the largest uh, yeah, company or uh, foundation for help for people with special needs, elderly people and so on in Bielefeld. And the goal of a number of projects we are cooperating now is to develop assistance technology which support the autonomy of people in need of care. The word autonomy is very important at this stage. And to help people with different disabilities, we are looking at dementia, intellectual ability, autistic dysfunction, obsessiveness, and so on. So we have the partners, we have the patients, and the software because we all use the same basic software we can develop systems nowadays quite fast. One example, a virtual assistant. And uh, here, uh, avatar is uh, talking to the human and to organize the week. And that's very important for elderly people, we have learned. That's a schedule over the week 
is for them very, very important and that they know each day what to do. And this is one of the examples with speech recognition and uh, here you see the avatar and the schedule. It's really interaction and it's also accepted. So it has been adopted. So of course we have to learn to deal, uh, how to deal with such persons, but we have the chance to have these people and these people are motivated to work with us. Now another project which is more to robotics, that's a teeth brushing assistance system. So people with dementia are not able to brush their teeth. Teeth brushing consists normally in our culture of about 10 steps, which are not clearly sequential, but it's a kind of a, of a graph you have to. And they lose the context. So we designed, we said, okay, if we can follow actions, if we know what is the goal, and we can detect that the person is uncertain what to do next, perhaps we can help. So we have the toothbrush has sensors, a recognition of single steps of toothbrushing is needed, and the assistance for feedback is very crucial in this context. So because there is no predefined sequence of tasks, we have to look at audiovisual system problems if necessary for the user. And so it, so it looks like. These are some of the steps to take water, to wash the mouth out, to take the toothpaste, and so on. And these are symbols. So as long as possible, when you see the uh, person, to detect the person is uncertain, then you give a symbol. If it is no help, you explain. You assist the symbol by speech. If you, if you realize it's no help, you call the uh, human caregiver. That's, that's the rule. And we have done a study with seven probands and you know there are strict rules in Germany to, for s such experiments. And uh, so it was in their daily life. They had a, uh, and it's not a design uh, area here, so it's really lab, a lab system. And uh, it was working, the experiment was in September, October, the first prototype uh, in real world. But how to measure the result? You can ask people, but we have about 10 sub-actions and you can measure how often does people call the human caregiver after a number of steps. And you can measure how often is a system calling for the uh, human caregiver or the person. The person is still allowed to call. Please come. And you see here the results. One to three steps in average, the persons are calling. And after some days, with the system, after seven to eight in average. And the result has been, except this, the caregiver as well as the patients has been very happy with the system. Because that is increasing autonomy. A technical system is not the person that helps you if it is assistive. And the technical system is for your part of the autonomy. We also like our, our cars because we are not able to run in a speed of 100 kilometers an hour. And this is the same behavior here. So this gives you an impression of what we are doing, of what we are perhaps in this SciTech. And I recall just the threefold mission I mentioned at the beginning. Technology for the human, may, I have not addressed today uh, production systems, production lines and so on. We have very interesting projects in interaction between workers and robots in the same environment. But I concentrated on, on other uh, examples. Scientific, okay, you have to publish, we have renewed, we, we got the second five years and we have been successful in bridging the cultures. So we use results from psychology, from biology, from uh, the social sciences, use them for our robots. And what occurs now is 
that we produce new questions for psychology, for uh, sociology, and so on. And of course, that's not me. I'm president of the university since five years, so I was just stealing experiments and work from other guys. I have been involved in this topic for in Bielefeld for 20 years, but not in the last five. They are doing the job, and my job has been really to present their work. Thank you very much for your attention. Some time for some questions. I'm curious. Dogs are something in between people and robots yeah. Yeah. who are unbelievably attuned to communicating with people, yeah. not so much with words, but by the tone of words yeah. and yeah. with gestures. Yeah. Have you ever tried this with dogs? Do you think about <laughs> trying it with dogs? Uh, we have not tried, but one of the persons doing our indirection studies from sociology. That has been part of, <laughs> of the Bielefeld spirit. Uh, we were playing together soccer. And I asked him, what are you doing? Yeah, he was a sociologist. What, I, what do I know what a sociologist is doing? And he told me, I'm looking at the interaction between humans and their dogs. And I said, oh, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of a very fruitful cooperation. <laughs> so we know, and there are some robots where you really not in Bielefeld, I, I know from the, from the community that you really s simulate or try to make this, but it's not easier. So the complex pattern, this reduction <coughs> of complexity does make it easier because it's difficult to translate a dog into a reaction. So uh, sure. Sure. Our, about us, we know a little bit more and according to uh, sociology and uh, psychology, there are some good results. Yeah. So we, we often hear about uh, robot culture in Japan and the yeah. non-Western way they relate to robots. Yeah. Do you think there's a German way of interacting with robots <laughs> specific to your? Yeah. So we are working strongly together with uh, Osaka, for example, and and I think one of one of the huge differences is in in Japan you can build robots which are really human-like. For Europeans, I. Yeah, I, I call it the Christian Jewish culture. Uh, the, the sketch idea, like in Walt Disney, is much better. So the people are not such scared about. I think problems like cognition, understanding, learning, in such a sense of the social kind of robotics, that's more in Europe. Yeah, in Japan, you have, for example, a lot of robots doing certain stuff, Muse, playing music, walking fast, uh, being pets yeah, with a short action reaction cycle and so on. But cognition is very interesting in, uh, in Europe and perhaps that's a European style. Compared to US, we have not one or, a, or we are not in a sense that the Department of Defense is sponsoring robot, ro robotics in Europe. So that's a difference to US. So it's coming more, and that's, that's an important point for us, this cooperation with daycare institutions, or, yeah, that's, or uh, uh, care for elder people. That's the way you can communicate robotics in, in Europe and in automation. Automation is, in, in Germany, the hot topic. When you look at the success of our car industry and so on, that's production lines. And they know nowadays that the production without humans do not work. And it's very complex uh, because of security to have this K4 robots and working with humans and how to give an object to a human, it's very difficult. So you have to place it somewhere. The robot has go away. The human open the cave, take the piece outside, and close the cave. And now we are really we have the first experience with a company where workers and robots are in an open space working together in manipulation. So driving around, that's okay in in, uh, in, in the production plants, but not really interaction. 
So perhaps that's a special. And, and you know from the economy that German economy and Japan economy are really relying on industrial production. Perhaps the yeah, United Kingdom not as much and uh, US. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Sorry, of? Uh, are people concerned about robots being a security and privacy threat? Yeah. These studies, um, so I believe there might, there's a stepwise going into a household. So, for example, this with dementia is an important step. Um, Assistive technology really helps. So if you look at a modern kitchen produced by Miele, it's really a lot of robots there, but they are not moving around. That's the only, uh, that's the only point. Or if you explain people, they are driving cars, and German, in Germany people like high-tech high, high cars. And if you explain them, what are they doing and what is the car doing? Yeah, they just can give hints and the car take the decision. Then it's also a kind of robot. And uh, step by step, it's accepted. By small pieces, not by the humanoid running around. That will not be the case. Uh, it can be the case, but not at the beginning. Because you had to yeah, adopt people also to this kind of technology, because this technology is doing an own task. Yeah, it's not pressing buttons, they are running around. And therefore, this study with the pseudo-astronauts is very important to have a robot running around for 18, for 18 days in a closed environment. Okay, these are young people, they get money for, okay, that's, uh, but it was really the complex study we have. And I'm sure, step by step, going into it, it's per, perhaps personally motivated. I have uh, parents and uh, my parents-in-law needed care for years and they did not like that all these people are coming at home. Machinery is at some points easier to accept. So we talk about to lengthen autonomy in time. That's our goal. Okay, thanks again. And if you have a specific question, he'll be around uh, for a little bit afterwards as well. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.